This is Boxing Tickets NA, and we're joined with Nick Campbell. Hi, are you, Nick? Hi, right, thanks for having me. Yeah, all good. All good, thank you. So, no, thanks. Pleasure to be on here, and hi, right, thanks for taking your time to interview me. As I was sort of saying to you off air before we were starting, you've, you've been on obviously quite a lot of interviews recently, so you were sort of glad in a way you've sort of got a bit of downtime so you can focus on your boxing a bit more as well. Oh, definitely. It's, you know what, it's part of the sport, and, um, you know, we need to be out there, we need to be raising a trophy, we need to put hopefully bums on seats whenever that can happen. And uh, I, it's part of the sport now to promote yourself and to promote the brand as such. So uh, it's, it's, it's part of the sport, so I need to get used to it. Um, and it's a good thing, I suppose, if your name's out there and people are interested. So I, no, brilliant. Definitely. And I say it, it's probably something that you, you're not used to and obviously, you know, you're not just obviously going to become a pro boxer now, you've always been a pro rugby player in the past as well, so you've been used to doing interviews and, and everything else, so you know, you've well re- well reversed on it, so to speak. Well, aye, I'm not, I kind of know what to say and what not to say, but I no, definitely, I mean, it's a bit different in boxing, obviously, and, and rugby, it's always a bit more humble and um, not so braggy, but boxing can kind of, you know, you've got to talk the talk and walk the walk sort of thing so it can I know it's different listen it's it's brilliant I'm loving the I'm loving the journey I'm loving the different you know being exposed to different things and stuff so that's no, great I'm I'm loving it yeah fantastic so so I know obviously it, it probably seems like quite a long time away ago now obviously you uh, were announced to be that you were going pro last month and you'd signed to the magic man Martin Lop. that's right I, I, I know Mark um Living in Jersey, uh, Mark used to live in Jersey as well, and um, met him through a mutual friend about, f- it would have just been over four years ago now, mm-hmm. and at that point I was still playing rugby, and basically got introduced to Mark, and Mark kind of said to me, look, go away, get as much experience as you can as an amateur, which was my goal, my goal mm-hmm. was never done pro, and uh, he said, go away, do as much as you can as an amateur, see how you go, and if it ever comes to a point where you feel that you might be you know, ready to turn over to the professional side of things, we can have a conversation. And um, I, obviously, I went away and got my experience as an amateur. Uh, competed, at, you know, won everything to win domestically in Scotland. Went, uh, you know, abroad with Scotland to different countries, Thailand, Lithuania, Russia, uh, you know, all over. And got kind of invaluable experience. And mm-hmm. then with everything going on in the world at the moment, my age... You know, a few factors. Mark got in contact with me and kind of said, you know, if, if you're thinking about turning pro now, could be the time to turn over and have a crack at it. So, I it was all, it was there was loads of different moving parts, but all kind of fell into place at the right time. And obviously with the rugby, I would never have met Mark. I would never have been living in Jersey uh, and been introduced to him. So it's funny how it all works. A, a, boy in Gla- a boy from Glasgow living in Jersey meets a boxing promoter living in Belfast and the two come together and now here we are. So I that's the way the world works, isn't it? It's a strange how it works sometimes, you know, like a chance you know, a chance meeting you're just meeting somebody for the first time and then you go, How did it all work out? You know, and as I say it's, it's when you think back on it and you go, you know, if it didn't do this or it didn't do that, would it now be coming to where I'm going to in the sport and things like that? But I say they always say destiny always uh, destiny always awaits and you know it's strange how it works out. So maybe in the future sometime obviously you know, he's a more to think about and going, wasn't it good that we actually really meet, you know, on now what yeah. we've achieved? I'm a big believer in fate, so everything happens for a reason. And obviously, I was destined to meet Mark that day, and now <laughs> here we are. So, hi, that's that. Yep. Um, and obviously, as I say, you know, what, what age are you now, 28? No, I'm 31, believe it or not. 31? No, I look young. No, I look young. <laughs> I'll, you can throw me out five or in the post for uh, saying you're only 28. So, so 31 now. Obviously, um, how long? How long we actually? How long did you play pro- professional rugby for? I played professional rugby for eight years. So, find my first, signed my first professional contract back when I was 19. Part of the academy with Glasgow Warriors. Uh, stayed there for four years. Then went on to you know in that four years progressed to a full professional contract. Then in 2013, I just decided that to get more regular game time and stuff like that, I was going to move to play for Jersey in the English Championship. So a bit of change of scenery from Glasgow to the wee island of Jersey in the Channel Islands. Um, played four years there, nearly 100 games. 
Um, and then just at the last the last season, which was 2016-17 or 2017, mm-hmm. uh, coming to the end of my contract, had a few more offers on the table. Uh, one to extend my contract at Jersey. I had kind of been in, you know, brief conversations about maybe signing on again. Um, a couple of different teams in England, a team in France, but I just kind of took the plunge and decided that boxing had always been, you know, a real passion and something that I'd always wanted to give a go and see what I could do. Mm-hmm. And I thought at 27, it was, you know, now or never really. If I was going to do it, it was then. If I, you know, if not, I was just going to need to park it and leave it and what could have been sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So I just decided to take the plunge. Um, decided to turn amateur with Deniston McNair, uh, a little boxing club in Glasgow. Uh, I briefly, you know, thought about going amateur with a club in Jersey, Leonis, but I wanted to go through the Scottish system, really, um, mm. and win the Scottish Championship. That was my main goal. So decided to link up with Jamie Cunningham there. And uh, my, the rest is history. Here we are now. So it went, it went pretty well. I managed to win everything domestically. Uh, became part of the Scottish Elite Boxing Group. Like I say, travelled around the world with them, going to different camps, different competitions, got some experience, some sparring experience down in um, GB Sheffield with the Scotland team down there. Mm-hmm. Sparred Martin Bacoli, um, you know, top pro boy just now, sparred boys in Russia, boys, you know, so it's been great. Like, yep. I had a fantastic four years learning, learning, learning a bit of the trade as such. I've, now starting another journey again, learning how to fight in the pro ranks. So mm-hmm. no, it's all been great. It's all been great. I've loved every minute of it. So I can't and, complain. And is it, you know, I guess sometimes, um, you know, whenever you were probably playing rugby and things at like a lot of times, if you, if you, I guess with any sport, you're going to get red mist and stuff like that at times as well. Like rugby can be a brutal sport at times, you know, um, not that I would watch much of it, but when you do see it and you see somebody flinging an elbow or somebody standing somebody's back of somebody's knee, it's only right that you sort of go, I want to punch him, is it? Did you, is it obviously a case now where you're going, I don't need to have red mist in a team of 15 anymore. It's now I can I can just have control of aggression and sort of fight for the sake of it. I can control aggression is the key word. You know, you've got to be aggressive and have that edge about you, but especially as you move up the levels in boxing, even like sparring lads, I've learned that, you know, the more you just steam in, the more likely it is you'll get picked off. There's a lot a lot of people watch it on the TV and go, ah, oh, it just looks like a great tear-up, but honestly, mm-hmm. that can be further from the truth. Uh, the amount of tactical, you know, everything, like tactical awareness, skill, aye, it's, it's a very, it's like a game of chess. And yeah. um Obviously, from playing playing rugby, a lot of people look at that and go, oh, it's just 15 guys clattering at each other, but it's not at all. So I was prepared for that. You know, when I moved over, I knew that there was going to be loads of things I was learning I'd never done before and having to pick it up quickly with my age and everything like that. So mm-hmm. you know, it's been a great learning curve. And, you know, I unfortunately, when you make a mistake, you get punched in the head. So you learn quickly. <laughs> yeah, whereas obviously in rugby when you make a mistake you may have teammates and stuff they they, they help you out obviously the only ones you sort of have and is going to be obviously your corner to go you know retreat retreat you know put your right hand up you know it's um, no, definitely i mean that's one of the things i get asked quite a lot is what t- what sports tougher and without a doubt boxing is a tougher sport mm-hmm. uh, the injuries and stuff in rugby are definitely worse than boxing um you know because you can get injured anywhere, knees, shoulders, ankles, necks, hand, everything. Um, concussion, bad as well in the sport. So, But in terms of mental toughness and, you know, just you're pitting yourself against another individual box and as the ultimate test really when it comes to mental toughness in my opinion. And, and I guess obviously, you know, when you picked up any injuries and sort of in rugby, you would have still got paid for it. Whereas obviously it shows that the sport of boxing as well, if you pick up an injury, you can't you can't get paid until you fight. No, definitely. I mean that was part of the sport. So obviously I've picked up a couple of knocks and stuff in my time playing rugby, but you were always still in with the team, always going to your rehab, physiotherapy. Um always, you know, still had to turn up first thing in the morning, leave last thing of the day. So I suppose it's been a good thing in a way because it's taught me how to be a how to be a good professional. Um mm-hmm. and a lot of the things transfer across from any sport on how to be a good pro and look after your body. So 
like I say, I don't think I'd be here now if it hadn't been for my past. So I've got a lot of th- to thank rugby for. Um, and like I say, if I wasn't over, you know, playing my trade in Jersey at the time, I would never have. Um, I would never have met Mark. So I like it's I say, it's all it's all part of the story and part of the journey. It's all filled out the same. And obviously, you know, one of the probably the biggest traits of, of carry across is a diet because you know, being able to play rugby, you know, you obviously can't be overeating and you have to be training right and everything else. So a lot of that will probably tie in well with obviously maintaining weight and things like that in boxing. Thankfully, I'm in the only weight division. We don't need to worry about getting under a weight. So as long as I'm over, I think it's, was it 91 kilos? Mm. I'm, 100, I'm sitting at 116 just now, but no, you're spot on. Just the lifestyle, diet, you know, you don't want to be too heavy. You want to sit at a kind of fighting weight and stuff like that. So it's learning your body, learning how it works, what you react well to, what you don't react well to. So, no, definitely it's, like I say, you pick up loads, loads of life experience as such from being mm-hmm. in that environment. And hopefully I can carry it across with me in the boxing. Yep, and I say, obviously, it'll, it'll work wonders in time. So I know sort of from sort of doing some research and stuff um, online, you know, you it's not like you're turning over to professional boxing just for the sake of, you know, you see some people and they, they're on reality TV and things like that. You've always had a a big, you've always had, as say, as a hobby, so to speak, and you're obviously involved early on in, in your, your teenage years in boxing. But um, you actually, you're actually at Hamden Park in the year 2000 um, to see Mike Tyson. That's correct. I mean, my dad, my grandfather, and my dad paid a fortune. I think he paid like two hundred pound a ticket, which back in two thousand was like maybe I call it to paying like five hundred pound a ticket now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we went. We were just first row outside ringside, so they were really good seats. Mm-hmm. But I remember it poured the rain all night, and the three of us were huddled under this little umbrella for the whole night. Sat there for about two hours. We got in before all the crowd and stuff got in. I, I was only ten, nine or ten at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we we got in early, got our seats, but the build up to the to the fight was, you know, you could feel the tension, and obviously Mike Tyson's one of the the great heavyweights of any generation. So mm-hmm. the hype around him being in Glasgow, been building up the whole week, being on TV. You were there, you're going to see Mike Tyson live. But he got in, everybody stood up, and then he knocked him out in about twenty seconds. I never seen a punch thrown. I couldn't see a. I couldn't see a punch. I can. I was standing up in my chair trying to look and see what I could see, but he actually he knocked the guy loose. At, I think it's loose Avarese. How you say it? You knocked yeah. him out twenty seconds. Um, but you know what? Like looking back now, I got. I was there to see Mike Tyson fight at Hamden. Do you know what I mean? How many people have seen Mike Tyson fight live? I can say they've seen him fight live. So, no, what an experience! And the Glasgow fight fans, very similar to the Belfast fight fans. I'm sure very vocal, very passionate. And uh, they, they get they get involved and immersed in the event, so it was an uh, an amazing experience. And, and uh, I guess obviously you know I, th- I think I actually seen something this morning that said um, Mike Tyson when he was a boxer he amassed nearly five hundred million as a professional boxer, and it's and it's scary to think it. Obviously, of you know Mike Tyson's baddest man on the planet, you know um, to be earning that sort of money, um, you know probably the reputation. Like I remember. Um, was it Lennox Lewis? They were doing a head to head, and he walked up. You know, as if they're doing the walk up to each other, and he just he just started swinging for him. Now, nah, listen, he was, you know, I, don't, I can't even think of the word for it, but nineteen years old, world heavyweight champion. Like I don't think I'll ever be repeated. He was just a mm-hmm. nature, uh, and the way he just knocked people out cold. That's why he wanted to tune in and watch it because you knew there was always a chance of him doing it. I think in his later career, always about some of the controversies and how he came back from it and stuff. But I know I was always a fan of Mike Tyson growing up. Always loved to tune in and watch him no matter what. So, and like you say, the money involved, especially in the heavyweight division, uh, I would take 1% of the 500 million. Nice, wouldn't it? But I guess obviously it's, it's putting your own stamp in the boxing as well. You know, it's a, like... With a, with a lot of heavyweight boxing, sometimes it comes down to the. It's not that you smack talk, so to speak, but you you have to sort of you have to promote yourself in such a way that people's going to tune in and watch. And you know, it's not just on. You know, you could knock out your first 20, 20 fighters as a pro. 
that people mm -hmm. may not be interested because you don't have the words to back it up as well, so to speak, as well. So it's oh, you need you need to be able. To, that's what I'm saying. It's a big difference from rugby because there's not a lot of trash talk in rugby. It's very respectful and very you know. Uh, it's a bit of an ad 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 I'm not listen. That's not really me to be honest. I'll I'll let my fighting do the talking. Mm -hmm. But like I say, if it you know if we're ever at the stage where we're we're getting in, involved in a alter like verbals before then I won't be shy you can be sure of that I'll definitely try and promote myself. Da Daniel Boyle's been saying you've been practicing your singing as well so um, are you going to start singing after your after your wins? Well I think Tyson's taking the mantle for that now I don't think anybody can really beat the big man when it comes to singing but I play the guitar so maybe I can sing and play the guitar I don't know if that that, that different angle on it reinvent reinvent it a bit but no I don't, I don't know about singing in the ring after it I, I knew not to obviously uh, tell you anything about that in, in advance but I'm sure you'd have seen it on the page where he was saying you were practicing your singing apparently you're not yeah. as good as James no, Tennyson yep but you're getting there we're, we're getting there we, we do enjoy a chant in between rounds on the pads and stuff like that so it's all about developing the boxing and the singing down at the cronk, so <laughs> it comes <laughs> up well then. Uh, and so so you know in, in in rugby and things like that it'd be more on psyching your opponents and things out. So you'll not be doing like the the all blacks and things like that with the 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 elbows and the and the knees and stuff. With a high no, I won't be doing the hacker. I'll leave that to the, to the All Blacks as well. Um, I don't think that can really be recreated on the rugby pitch. I don't even, I, you know what? I don't even think any of the Kiwi boxers do that. Jo Joseph Parker's fighting this weekend, so it'll be interesting to see if he does the hacker before us, but I doubt it. But it'll be interesting. Yeah, there's something different on it. So Because I, I think they're, 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 both, the, the new, they're both the New Zealand ones. boxers as well, so you, you might see something different for a change if the two of them might do something in the ring. But listen, in these times, I wouldn't. Nothing would surprise me. So I tune in and find out. I guess. <laughs> I guess that'd be one way of sort of building your profile up, where you sort of do a wee dance or sing or a guitar before you before you start your fight. Yeah. I know. I don't know how you play the guitar with the gloves on. Though that might be a bit <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Suppose we could get Mark involved in that somehow. Um. So sort of sort of looking. Um. I know obviously early on, um, whenever you obviously, after the Mike Tyson and things like that, you, you did actually get into boxing early on and um, was it more a case of you seen your talents was more within rugby than, than in boxing and obviously was, is that why you decided to go down the rugby route rather than the boxing? No, not, not really, no, just like I was doing well in rugby. I, I was doing all right my boxing training as well, but a lot of my mates played rugby. Rugby's a team sport when you're growing up. You wanted to be in around your mates and away at the weekend playing and stuff like that. And it, I just had, at that time, you know, more was happening in rugby. I was going through the path pathway system, uh, playing for uh, Glasgow, then going on to play for Scotland and stuff like that. And it just seemed like there was more opportunities in rugby, really. But it wasn't a case of going... You know, I'm more talented at rugby, I'm less talented at boxing. It was just a mm. case of, you know, the, the opportunities were there for, for the rugby. Um, and there's not much going on, like, there, there wasn't even much going on in the boxing sense at, you know, 14, 15 years of age. Um, there was obviously, mm. like, Scottish championships and stuff like that. But nah, rugby just felt like the natural progression for me at the time. And uh, I decided to go. I think my mum was happier that I decided to do that, so... Aye, that was just a progression, really. Yeah, because obviously I know sometimes that you know I know boxing was within your family as well. Like your your grandfather obviously boxed um, mm -hmm. quite a bit back in the day, and obviously your your father's been a big box fan as well. And he said that he, the threes were at Hamden Park for the boxing as well. So you know boxing's always been on your route. So it's it's not like people online could sort of say that you finished rugby and you just decided to be a boxer. You know it's always been there. It's it's always been ingrained in you. That's something that you wanted to do. Yeah, listen, it's always, I've always done a little bit of training alongside my rugby and stuff like that, especially in the off-season or whenever I felt I needed to pick my fitness up a bit. So I've always been doing little bits and bobs. Obviously, I never thought when I was playing rugby because, you know, it's not possible. But um, mm -hmm. I, it's always been something something I've 
I've enjoyed doing something that I've, you know, give, given a bit of time to. So it's not a case of just walking in off the street and going, oh, you know what, I fancy having a go at box. That's not the case. So, no, nah, definitely. I think, you know, what I managed to do in the amateurs and the bit of experience I got in that kind of proves that, you know, I wasn't just a gimmick. I wanted to actually do something. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this if I thought it was just a gimmick, but it's like a box, because what's the point? Anybody could do that. Yep, and and like boxing's a brutal sport as well. So it's you know if you wanted to pick any sport just for the sake of it, boxing's probably the the worst you could you could pick because you know like what one punch anything can sort of happen within the sport as well. So you have to be um, really dedicated to be involved in boxing nowadays. I think you know we live in the age of Instagram, social media, and it can be great and a powerful tool, but also you know it's a dangerous tool as well because there's a lot of guys now who love the. Instagram boxer lifestyle, but that's never it's never been for me. You know, I'm I'm all I'm all about pushing myself and seeing how much I can achieve. I'm not just doing it for likes or I stick it up on a social media page. It's about actually achieving stuff in real life and mm-hmm. applying it to the sport that I want to be. You know, I want to do well in. So no, nah, like I think anybody who thinks that that's what we're here for, hopefully I can surprise them in the next couple of years and show them that. We're no gimmick. We're here to make a statement and have a right go, and hopefully be involved in some great fights, and you know, prove that all the people that said you're crazy are wrong. Yep, exactly. And you sort of, you sort of made the, you know, you you've give yourself a good sort of goal to set out with. First of all, you want to become. It's getting this right now. Uh, Scotland's first British heavyweight champion. Aye, there's never been a British heavyweight champion from Scotland. Um, I think Gary Cornish challenged for it against Sam Sexton a few years ago and Sam Sexton won. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, that's got to be a driver for any Scottish heavyweight now or in the future. A few kicking about at the moment. Um, so, you know, who knows? But that's my goal. My goal is to become the first Scottish British heavyweight champion. I'm under no illusion either how difficult that would be. Um the type of guys that are operating at that level now is, you know, pretty, pretty good. So I think Joe Joyce and Daniel Dubois just fought for it. So that shows you they're now going on to like, well, Joe Joyce is now going on to a good level. So to get there is going to be a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of good guys domestically, uh, a lot of talent in the heavyweight division at the moment. But like I say, you want, that's the time you want to be involved in it because it's exciting and you're going to be put into hard challenges and yeah, sink or swim. So when the time comes, yeah, that I look forward to being in, being in that mix. Exactly. And be, being, a, being a professional, obviously, athlete for, for quite a few years, you know that you obviously have to have goals to, to set yourself to. And I know none, none obviously bigger than the fact that becoming Scotland's, you know, first um, sc- first Scottish heavyweight champion. I knew it was gonna, that was my tongue twister. Um, but obviously there's no better goal than sort of to set yourself with that. Obviously it is going to take time. What have you thought of the... What have you thought of the domestic scene recently? You know, as, as you're probably right in saying there, you know, the standards been set very high in, in British boxing and the heavyweight landscape. So what have you been it's thinking of? It's on fire, really, when you think about it. I mean, I think we've got, who have we got? We've got the two best guys in the world at the moment. We've got Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua, who are, looks like they're going to have a dust up quite soon to decide mm-hmm. who's going to be the undisputed. Uh, we've got Joe Joyce, obviously. Daniel Dubois is a fantastic fighter. Um, you know, Fabio Wardley just coming through. I think he's English champion now. Looks like, you know, great talent, great prospect. Uh, fellow countryman Mitchell Barton just turned over at the pro side. Um, you've got Jay McFarlane in Scotland as well. Um, then you've got Tommy Welch, Scott Welch's boys just turned over. David Akin, Accolade, Adelaide, I don't know how yeah, to pronounce Adelaide. it. Adelaide. You know, he looks like a fantastic prospect as well. You just had the young lad coming through on the Matchroom show at the weekend, Johnny Fisher. Yeah. So it's bouncing. There's so many good fighters. There's so much, there's going to be so much competition domestically. Obviously, Dylan White as well. I missed out Dylan White. He's just mm. been in the Rumble on the Rock in Gibraltar against Povetkin in his rematch. So, I, I mean... I don't think the British heavyweight division's ever been stronger, really. So, um, and then even like so, the I've 
can't believe I've forgotten, but Solomon Dacre, he, I sparred him down at GB, he was the ex-GB podium boxer, so there's another, you know, really exciting prospect coming through, and I'm happy to be part of that, and happy to put my hat in the ring and see what happens. And, and I guess, obviously, you know, when you mentioned so many names and stuff like that as well, you know, boxing couldn't be in a better place than the heavyweights right now, you know, every, every belt there is in, in, in the world scene is, is in Britain, mm-hmm. you know, so there's going to be more highlight put on, on on British boxers, Scottish boxers, Irish boxers, Welsh, you know, whatever, you know, anybody that's from the UK and Ireland pretty much is going to, in that division, is going to have serious eyes put on them, so what a perfect time for you to turn over. Exactly. Like, like I say, I, I never got into this to tick a box. I got into this to try and achieve something. And um, regardless of who's around, you're going to have to fight these guys anyway if you want to achieve your goals. So it's all about putting the time in, the grafting, and uh, trying to improve as much as you possibly can so that, when, it, like I said, when the time comes, compete and win at that level. And that's you know all I'm focused on is improving every fight, improving every sparring session, listening to Tony, listening to Mark, listening to Dan, and uh, just letting the ball roll from there and try and improve as much as I can, soak everything in. Still feel as if I'm very much in the upward curve. I've only been boxing for pr- properly for like nearly four years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, I'm still, you can still mould me. Whereas, you know, guys who've been boxing since they were 9, 10, 11 years old are setting their ways now. So... I feel as if I've got a lot more to give and a lot more to learn. And I can, the, the only way is up, really, for me, to be honest. And, and you sort of mentioned Tony there. I'm guessing Tony's going to be your full-time trainer. Tony's going to be training me, yeah, um, in preparation for all my fights. So, great guy. Tony's obviously got Dan as well um, as his second. So, two, two very knowledgeable, passionate guys that I got on well with, that Matt gets on well with. And it's a great team to be involved in. So now you look at what James Tennyson's done. I know it's a mm-hmm. different division, but he's uh, he's now very, very close to being inside the top 10 in that division. And, you know, he probably is inside the top 10. He's he's, he's going to be there or thereabouts. So it's exciting to be involved in that kind of environment and those kind of coaches and another fighter like James Tennyson. So, and and if you can sort of re- if you can learn to replicate things off James, you know he's got he's got serious knockout power in both hands. So you'd be sort of asking for some tips and going, how can I knock people out with both these hands? You know, um, I think yeah. I think James hasn't won. I think it's more than five years since his fights, seen the final bell. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me because he can punch. I'll tell you that for free. When I've watched him in training, he can bang, and you only need to look at his last couple of performances and. Mm. Just It like, doesn't matter whether they're a slightly better boxer than James or he's down on the cards a bit. He's got that level that just puts them to sleep and that's it. Game over. So no, definitely trying to pick up on that and trying to steal bits from him and learn bits from him and picking his, picking his brain about different things. And Obviously, Tony and Dan have been there with him since the beginning. So mm-hmm. they've got, you know, they've got a massive, they've played a massive part in his development and I just hope that they can help develop me the same way. I'm listening to everything they tell me. And, right, let's see what it takes us. Yeah, but as I say, I've, I've seen some of the pictures, obviously the size difference between between you and James. Obviously, the 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 taller you are, sometimes the harder is the, the sort of, you know, with, with power and things like that, because obviously you may be punching down in some days as well. So it's sort of putting a lot of extra effort into being able to sit down in your punch probably a bit more and, Probably trying to be a six-foot boxer rather than a six-foot seven boxer, in a way. Listen, I mean, you've got to use your advantages. You look at the Klitschko's, I think they were six-foot six and six-foot eight. And I think Klitschko had over 50 knockouts. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it can be done. You've just got to adapt to your body type and box to your strengths. So, uh, I'd be crazy if I wasn't trying to use my six-foot seven-inch frame and my 18 and a half stone I've got. So... There's a lot of power behind those punches, um, just given the fact that you're that size. So when the technique and, like you say, sitting into the punches comes, then we'll be hitting even harder again. So now it's growing <laughs> looking forward to it. And, and obviously, I'm guessing um, you've, you know, you've been doing quite a lot of interviews and everything else. You, you've hit your hands and you just want to get going. You know, boxing's obviously now starting to return more on a weekly basis in the UK. Um, have you any idea sort of when you're going to be looking at making your debut? Hopefully, going to be making my debut next month. 
Uh, nothing set in stone as yet, but it's looking very promising for next month. Um, so fingers crossed that you know everything happens. The obviously COVID situation keeps improving and everything gets to go ahead. Because I like you say, we're we're itching to go. We're ready to go. We're ready to do the business. And and obviously, as you're saying, there were lockdown restrictions and things appear. And, you know, I think from the 17th of May, they're saying that some sort of crowds can return. And from the 21st of June, they're reckoning obviously everything will go back to normal. Is it is it crossed your mind that, that you could potentially be on, you know, you could you could end up potentially being on the Fury, well, Fury uh, Joshua undercard? Nah, listen. Uh, the dreams, a, wouldn't it? I don't know about that. That would be something, you know, lovely forever. That would be a dream. But... Listen, I'm trying not to think too much about it because mm-hmm. you know what it's like with us. You know, there's so many moving parts. Things change on a week by week basis. All I can do is just keep training, grafting, putting in the work, and then when the time comes, whatever that may be, on whatever undercard it may be, on whatever show. Uh, I know Mark's got real great working relationships. Where they had that match room, Frank Warren, BT. Um, like whatever whatever card it is, we will be ready to get on there and do the business. So now I'm I'm excited. The magic man can get you anywhere, so he can nowadays. He's relentless. He is. He and, him, so I know he can definitely can. And I'm guessing, obviously, you know, with with pick and box not obviously so late, you know, and obviously making your debut at 31. I'm guessing you want to be kept busy. Yeah, just want to be out as much as possible, um, getting as much sparring as possible. But yeah, I want to try and be out at least four or five times this year, uh, minimum. So yeah, want to soak it all in, get as much experience as possible, be fighting as often as possible and see what it takes us. Yep, and, and obviously, sort of want to leave you in sort of one final question. You know, I know you've obviously goals to become Scotland's first British heavyweight champion, but what sort of goals and aspirations have you set yourself that you want to achieve in the next 12 to 24 months within boxing? Well, like I said, I want to try and have at least 10, 12 fights in that space of time. Hopefully some good knockouts on the way. But my, my goal is just take it one fight at a time, learn as much as possible going into every fight and you know give a good, good performance every time I'm in the ring. And like I say, when you take care of the small goals, everything on the way, the big goal can be achieved, but it's only by, you know, chipping away, working hard, letting the fighting do the talking, and when I get in the ring, making sure I give a good account of myself and put the performance I know I'm capable of putting in. And uh, like I say, I'll leave the rest up to Tony, Mark, and Dan, with how the progression goes, but that's all I can do. I can just focus on one fight at a time, progressing every training session, and progressing every fight, and that's all there is to it. Definitely. Well, well, listen, Nick, well, obviously, thank you very much for obviously joining us today. Um, you know, we're probably, you know, one, say probably within a month, probably be making your debut as well. So I'm sure you'll not be scratching at the knuckles for too much longer. Um, yeah, and I'm sure we'll obviously catch up with you again soon. Definitely been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to chatting to you again soon.